morning and welcome to Running on Hometown Alaska. I'm your host, Kathleen McCoy. Today's topic is the April 6th municipal election for four seats on the Anchorage School Board. Ballots will be mailed to voters on March 15. Now is the time to wrap your head around who you plan to vote for. We hope to help in two ways. We've assembled a panel of engaged individuals who follow education issues in Anchorage to discuss particular challenges facing the ASD. And we invited the 16 school board candidates to answer 10 questions. 12 of them responded. Their answers parallel the topics that our panel will discuss. The point of this approach is to offer context upfront for voters who want more information as they prepare to mark their ballots. After a panel discussion, we'll highlight how candidates responded to that issue. After today's program, all the candidates' answers will be posted in full online at alaskapublic.org running. Before I introduce our panel, let me say we'll be getting some help from Maya, Maya Ina, who's Alaska Public Media's education reporter. Um, she will offer some context at the top of the show. And we also have, I'm thrilled to say, uh, joining me in the studio today is co-host E.J. David. He's jumping on the Hometown Alaska team. So I'd like to uh, welcome Maya and also welcome E.J. Hey, magandang umaga. That means good morning in my Tagalog <laughs> language. Okay. Happy to be here today. Happy to have you, EJ. And Mayawa, happy to have you. Um, let me just quickly introduce our panel, uh, and then we'll let Mayawa get started with um, some context. Um, Abby Hensley's on today. She's the executive director of Best Beginnings, a public-private partnership that works towards school readiness. We have Tam Agosti Giesler, who's a former teacher and former school board member, and James Smallwood, who has run twice for the school board and is an active parent advocate. Um, also, I want to share our phone numbers. We do welcome your questions or comments throughout the hour. Uh, you can join in the conversation at 550-8433 in Anchorage or statewide. Well, I think we don't need state. We're talking about the Anchorage School District, so we'll keep it local. Uh, but we do have email at hometown at alaskapublic.org. And if you'd like to email a question in, we, we're happy to do that. We'll keep checking that as the hour goes on. Um, okay, so I think we are ready to turn to Maya. Hi, Maya. How are you? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. And just so the audience knows, only EJ and I are in the studio. All of our guests are on the phone in locations around Anchorage. Maya, I think you're still home. Um, so it, it makes it interesting because as we try to uh, discuss things, we can't see each other's eyes and faces mm -hmm. and stuff. So um, but yeah. anyway, uh, I'm really happy to have you, Maya. And we just thought it would be really nice opportunity to have the education reporter just kind of set the context for this school board race. There's a couple of issues to, to point out. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Maya. Sure. So thank you for having me. Um, it's been really interesting covering the education beat over the past year. And, you know, I was just kind of checking along at my school board meetings and then all of a sudden the school shut down. So um, there's a lot that's happened in the past year. And that makes this year's election pretty interesting just because of all of the sort of emotion, all the people that are invested, just sort of the impact that school closure has had on so many families and students and everybody kind of associated. So um, there's an opportunity here for the public to engage now that we have an election coming up. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out. Uh, the other part of this is, as we mentioned at the top, there are four seats that are on the ballot, um, and it's a seven-member body. So uh, not, it's not usual for, it's not common for four seats to be on the ballot, as I understand. Um, the most that it normally is is three. Um, several years, it's two seats, but this time we have four that are on the ballot. So um, it's possible that, you know, it could be four entirely new members on the on the school board at the end of this so we have we have some incumbents how, running right Maya? some incumbents are running yes that, some incumbents are running so they are they're hoping to retain their seats but they are you know on the ballot yeah just like everybody else trying to to retain their seats um it's mm -hmm. 16 a large field <laughs> <laughs> for four seats um, <laughs> Yes and no, and just because there are four seats, so you're uh, you're going to have at least four people who are going to be running, and and so 
I would say that it, it's large just because of the sheer number of people, but there's also four positions. So that's going to automatically kind of broaden the field a little bit. Um, but a lot of people have thrown their hat in the ring to say that they you know, want to participate in this body. And a lot of people have sort of mentioned what's happened over the past year as a reason for them wanting to get involved. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to see as well, how the pandemic has impacted those who want to participate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I guess you have mentioned that the pandemic has kind of set the tone in a different way for this election. Um, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, if you can. Uh, there's money re- being raised for candidates uh, in school board. Could you talk a little bit about that? And the numbers that we have now will likely be updated closer to the election. But maybe you can tell us what we know now. Yeah. So um, it's kind of interesting. Fundraising um, tells you different things about who has some support and who does not have much support, how many people are contributing, that sort of thing. So the latest round of fundraising reports are due today. So I'll be able to do a little bit more analysis of that later on. Um, But from the uh, last round of reporting uh, for fundraising, um, Dora Wilson, who's running for seat S, um, has actually raised the most of the candidates out of all of the candidates. She's raised about $47,000. And, and then right behind her is Carl Jacobs, um, and then right behind Carl is Kelly Lessons. So these are um, fairly, um, I, I don't know that I would put them on the left, but they're fairly progressive candidates, I would say. Um, and they seem to be, you know, gar- garnering a lot of support, at least uh, monetarily so far. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so I think the total amount for this this school board race right at the moment is like $150,000 to total if you were to add all that up. And we, of course, have a mayoral, mayoral race going at the same time. So just interesting to see the, uh, the spread. Um, let's see. Something else I think you and I talked a little bit before uh, the show about the CARES funding that carried ASD this year. Um, how, how, tell us a little bit about that and uh, one that, what the impact of when that money goes away? Sure. Um, so like schools all across the country, um, having to sort of stand up a distance learning, virtual learning, uh, like a lot of businesses having to all of a sudden have PPE, having to have different um, materials needed in order to operate um, social distance or um, with safety and health in mind, um, that really wreaks havoc on uh, school budget. Um, we also had a lot of fluctuation with enrollment, whether students and families were leaving the district, staying in the district, choosing different options. So that created a lot of uncertainty in the budget as well. Um, so there has been some support from the federal government uh, through the CARES Act funding and the different uh, release packages that have come out um, throughout the year. And um, I think another one is working its way through Congress right now. Um, And so what administrators anticipated as sort of this devastating blow to their budget due to loss of enrollment, due to um, extra expenditures, um, didn't necessarily materialize. So a lot of schools were able to sort of um, do that relief from the federal government. A lot of schools were able to kind of make it through. Um, But it'll be interesting to see what happens when it's time to be back in school when that relief is no longer there for this time period. And that's going to be sort of maybe a year or the next two, three years to think about um, prior to the pandemic in the last budget season uh, for the Anchorage school district, there were lots of um, proposed cuts. There was um, a conversation about cutting the Ignite program, which is a gifted program Mm -hmm. for um, high achieving students. And there were thoughts about cutting different health education positions. Um, There were thoughts about cutting different security positions. Um, All of those are kind of saved through a mixture of the nesting and the budget. Um, But the sort of caveat was that, you know, you're kind of kicking the can down the road here and it's going to be have to address, uh, going to have to be addressed sooner or later. So um, it seems like schools are are okay for now through the release packages. different levels of government, um, but 
you know, these candidates that are running for the school board are going to have to deal with the budget at some point. Mm hmm. Right. And also, you mentioned that there's a resolution coming before the school board soon that that uh, successful candidates may face. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Myla? Sure. So um, one of the uh, jobs of the board is to create policies for the superintendent to implement that sort of speak to the board's thoughts and ideas about the direction of how uh, the district should be going um, and how they should be helping students learn. Um, and one of those policies that's been being worked on for months and months and months now, um, there are actually two different policies. One is about anti-racism and it's sort of, uh, it just kind of plants a flag and says, you know, the district explicitly says the district rejects any form of racism. And um, there's a line in there as well about um, suggesting that instruction be cognizant of the history of racism in Alaska and in America and, and support critical thinking about those ideas. And um, so that's one policy. The other policy is about instructional equity and that uh, asks the superintendent to submit an annual equity report to the school board. Um, and so those policies are being drafted. They uh, have been presented to the public. There's going to be um, some town halls and some other engagement, I believe, um, about uh, gathering comment on these policies. Uh, but the vote for these policies and whether or not to approve them and therefore uh, send it to the superintendent to figure out how to implement them, that vote is going to be happening um, in April. And so right after the election. So depending on who gets elected to the school board, um, that will likely be one of their first votes. Hmm. Interesting. Do you expect it to, uh, do, you, do you expect both of those to be somewhat volatile? Um, I don't know if they will be volatile. I think there's already been uh, some public testimony about these policies on both ends of the spectrum. There seems to be some concern just about what this actually means for the classroom and how that might change instruction, curriculum, that sort of thing. Um, that's not what these policies necessarily address, uh, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, who comes out to support it and who comes out to uh, try to um, think about something different or a different way of approaching these issues. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, I don't know, Mayo, do you have anything else? I also want to say, EJ, do you have any questions for Mayo? Anything that, and she talked about not these right issues now. popped I'm up. I'm, I'm learning a lot, Mayo. Thanks so much. Yeah, it is. It's really nice to, I did not know about some of those uh, new policies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know CARES funding, uh, relief funding, uh, has helped the district uh, breathe a little bit, uh, even as it went through these really difficult uh, closed sessions and uh, online learning. Um, Maya, anything else you want to share with our audience today? Um, I think the only thing that's kind of interesting to me is just to see how candidates talk about moving forward, um, kind of not necessarily in a post-pandemic world, but, uh, you know, next week, all of the secondary students will be will have the option to learn in person if they want to. So um, even though it'll, it will have been a year for some of them, you know, last year when schools closed, the students were on spring break. And so now we're coming up on a year, they're on spring break right now, and some of them haven't been back to school in that time. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the district moves forward through the rest of this year and how the school board candidates are talking about what it means to move forward. And some of them are talking about, you know, bringing students back. Well, students will already be back by the time they'll be on the school board. So what is sort of the next step uh, for these school board members and how they hope to interact with the superintendent? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, all right. Well, I think that, that gave us some context to start our discussion with our panel and then to turn to... Uh, uh, what our candidates said. So I want to say thank you, Maya. I know we're going to lose you and, and we're, you'll be gone for the rest of the hour, but we really appreciate you taking the time to kind of set the stage for us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Maya.
Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, your panelists have to say, and it'll be uh, helpful for my reporting as well. So I'm <laughs> looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. That's great. All right. Um, let's see. I think I told folks that, you know, with 16 candidates, there was mm-hmm. just no way to have them all on the on the air. And then there's also COVID restrictions. So th- this is the, the path we've chosen, which is the panel mm-hmm. to talk about the issues that maybe voters can think about. And then we'll turn to what candidates had to say. They had 10 questions. I don't think we're going to get through all 10 of them, maybe four or five. But just know that their complete answers are going to be on uh, alaskapublic.org slash running right after this show and all the way through the election. So if you want to, you know, ponder and uh, as we highlight what they say, there's no way we can cover everything that they said. Uh, So we really do encourage you to go ahead and look at their written statements. Um, But at that, let's get started. Uh, Go ahead, EJ. Let's go. All right. Well, as we just heard from Iowa, and as we all know, uh, school over the past year has been immensely affected by COVID-19 pandemic. Many people are concerned about kids falling behind. Um, So I want to ask our panel, uh, what are your thoughts on how Anchorage schools can recover student learning loss after the COVID shutdowns? Um, I want to start with Tam. Go ahead, Tam. Okay. Thank you very much for having me on today. Um, In terms of recovering, I think we need to shift our paradigm a little bit in the, you know, our expectation has always been that a student will complete their public education in 13 years, K K through 12. And I think maybe we need to uh, realign that thinking in, in terms of this pandemic and maybe allow those students who did not, um, uh, get a full year of learning in this year to uh, continue in that realm, uh, you know, the same grade for another year without attaching a stigma to it, you know, without saying, oh, they're repeating third grade, um, but instead maybe calling it a plus year, third grade plus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think it will ever hurt our society uh, uh, immensely if students are in school 14 years as opposed to 13 years. Hmm. But again, that should be uh, based on choice and based on um, how well they have uh, met their uh, learning uh, needs this year. So That is interesting. Yeah. James, you have something to add? Yeah. Uh, so the, obviously this is a really challenge for me and my wife this year. And, you know, I feel as though that we kind of became the, the teacher's assistants by working <laughs> at home and, and ensuring our kids were getting the education that they need. And, you know, for some, it didn't, you know, being online didn't work that well for them. And so, therefore, it was best for uh, kids to kind of go back a little earlier before um, before the spring break um, season is over. And, um, and, and for our kids, actually, our kids actually went back um, back to school. And I see that they're driving even more at this point. But but um, for those kids who, who struggled and for those kids who didn't even show up to some of those Zoom meetings, um, you know, I think this is a, one of the biggest challenges that the school just is going to have to going to have to um, figure out on because there's a handful of kids that that are going to that are failing, and it's more of a uh, of an attendance issue versus that they could not be able to do it. And what I mean by that attendance issue, they they probably weren't able to log in. They probably didn't have uh, the resources that they need. Um, can they catch up? I believe that they can, um, and I believe that there's there's. There's definitely that possibility. It might even require uh, summer school um, if that's what that means. But um, if the kids can thrive in the classroom and get them back in the classroom, then I think that would be um, the goal for them. I, I, I would not want a kid to be held back, um, and I would, I would hate to see uh, what we call what, what Tam mentioned, a, a plus year, um, not because of a stigma, but – um, if the kid is capable of, of learning the material and understanding the material, and it's just it's not their fault, um, I do believe that there's there are opportunities out there that that um, they'll be able to catch up. And if it does mean a little bit more summer school or even working a little bit more during their spring break, um, I think that's I think that's a possibility um, if the school board would ever adopt something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you, James. Abby, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, I like the idea of looking at things from a different perspective. Um, My perspective would would be a little different from Tam's, um, and that one of the things that has bothered me really about this whole year is when we talk about 
children being behind and children losing and children, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's like it, we know it's not the child's fault. Um, and so um, I, I, would, I would be more um, inclined to, to go on the side of how can we sort of fill it up again? And whether, as James suggested, you know, it might be summer school or, or some other way that, that children could get more learning. Um, but it's still going to be tough. And, and maybe as we, we need to rethink what our expectations of children are um, at various grade levels and figure that they might be, you know, um, not quite meeting what ordinarily we would have put in in front of them as expectations um, this semester, this year, but that over the course of time they could they could be be back to what the expectation was, and and you know I, I don't know how that might work. I just feel like we shouldn't penalize children for something that wasn't their fault, mm-hmm. and I know that there's been talk before in the in Anchorage about um, about year-round school, um, and. You know, maybe that's something that we need to look at um, in order to provide more opportunities for kids. As I understand it now, children aren't even, you know, going to spending as much time in the classroom, those that are back in, in classrooms, as they were, you know, pre-pandemic. So mm-hmm. we're, we're already spending less time with kids in the classroom. I know it's been tough for everybody, for teachers, for families, for children, um, and let, let's think about ways that that we can make everybody, um, well, that we can not, not feel that, that we're penalizing people or people feel like they're being penalized or that their children are being, um, uh, you know, held back or somehow less than what they ought to be. Mm. I wanted to jump in and say I'm, I'm hoping that some of this uh, pandemic um, funding is going to be used to um, expand the summer quarter, make it an intensive summer quarter, um, I know when I was on the board, there was often issues of having to cut some of the um, summer programs because of funding issues. And if any, if there's any time to expand that, it would be now. And if there's any time to really rethink the paradigm of a school calendar based on the agrarian calendar, I think it's now. And to really look at um, four quarters, again, not to mandate that people have to go to school four quarters, but at least three of the four. And I know it's incredibly complex. It's not a simple issue, but it's time to look at those uh, possibilities. Okay. We need to take a tiny break here. Um, We will come back and meet up with our panel again, and and shortly we'll go to the candidates' responses. Uh, So, uh, I'm going to sign up, but, but we'll be right back with Abby Hensley, James Smallwood, Tam Augusta Giesler to talk about the, the issues facing the school board and to hear what candidates have to say about that. So you're listening to Hometown Alaska. I'm your host, Kathleen McCoy. You're listening to Hometown Alaska from Alaska Public Media. For more information about this episode, visit us online at alaskapublic.org. back to Running on Hometown Alaska. I'm your host, Kathleen McCoy, joined by co-host E.J. David. And our topic is the school board election uh, that voters will make decisions on on April 6th. And there are 16 candidates. Um, So instead of uh, trying to get candidates on the air, what we've done is invite um, local experts and uh, 
you know, community engaged folks who have watched education issues to be a panel for us to talk about uh, the issues uh, facing the Anchorage School District. And their discussion parallels um, questions that we sent to the candidates. So mm -hmm. we were just finishing up talking about uh, making up learning loss um, and uh, because of the COVID, you know, so mm -hmm. many school closures, they're starting to open up now. Uh, but there's obviously been an impact on, on students. So, um, mm -hmm. EJ, do our panelists have anything else to add or we'll go right to the to the uh, uh, what the mm -hmm. candidates had to say? Uh, Abby, do you have anything to add to what uh, oh, no, time left? You. OK. And I think James, are you on? Yes. Um, okay. James, yeah, anything back. to add? Um, no, I wish I caught the, the telling of what Abby was saying, but um, mm -hmm. I'll just I'll catch the rewind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, 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 we've lost you briefly there. I'm sorry. Um, and that's some of the joys of doing mm -hmm. things when everybody's not in the studio. Uh, by the way, I, I, I see that I'm getting some emails, and I will try to get to them uh, as we can. Uh, we can still take your questions at 550-8433, uh, and then the email is hometownatalaskapublic.org. And just, you know, I see that we're getting questions directed directly at candidates. I will pass those questions on to the candidates. Uh... And there's also a statement about a candidate. I will read that. Uh, but, um, you know, anything else you want to talk about <clears throat> about the school board election, it's, it's all fine. <clears throat> but now what we want to do is uh, quickly run through what candidates said about this issue of learning loss. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 12 candidates, so bear with me. I will go quickly, and I, I tell you again that their full answers will be on our website. Um, Dora Wilson uh, says that she wants to empower teachers to be successful and to ensure that teachers have the support they need to address a potentially more varied group of needs in the classroom. She says that aside from the learning loss, the reality is that many kids have experienced some hardship and that may impact their learning. So she thinks that mental health should be prioritized. Um, Rachel Blakesley, that's another candidate, says, yes, you know, we know that there have been loss. Uh, there's lots of studies talking about that, but she points to studies that, that are showing uh, how to overcome that loss. And she is very interested in exploring more opportunities for expanded learning, whether that's extended school days, extended school year, structured after school programs, weekend school, summer school. She's also uh, promoting the idea of high quality one-on-one -on -one uh, or extremely small group tutoring. And she thinks this is very important. And yes, it, it is. Ex it could be expensive. So she's suggesting that perhaps with paraprofessionals, recent college grads, and community groups and nonprofits might be able to help with some of this tutoring. She also really wants it to be targeted to students who need uh, the, the most serious level of help. She also wants to help families with accessible resources, maybe an online hub of tools, uh, and uh, including a sort of a phone-based inquiry opportunity. So not everybody has internet, can't go to a, a hub mm -hmm. on the internet, but mm -hmm. they could call in and ask. Carl Jacobs is another candidate, and he's very mindful of the federal funding that came through through the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. That was $50 million to the district, a one-time payment. And uh, he's expecting that the funds will facilitate an expanded and accessible summer program. Um, and he also says that we have to be mindful that you can't solve it that fast as we go forward into the 21-22 school year. He's expecting that uh, some of this money should be used to facilitate some after-school options as students still try to catch up. Edgar Blatchford is another candidate, and uh, he just basically says, don't lose what we have by reopening schools prematurely. Well, we know schools are already opening, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but he was a go cautious, go slow was his thought. Um, Elisa Vakalis is a returning uh, candidate. She, she's on the board now. She's running for re-election. Uh, she is saying that the ASD is looking at a robust summer school program, and she also mentions that the relief funding uh, should be focused toward making up this learning loss. Pat Higgins, uh, who was on the school board years ago and is running again, uh, said summer school is an important option. Um, and he, he cites a 2010 study where elementary students advance when they go to summer school. Um, Dan Loring, another candidate, uh, his answers involve mo mostly engaging the community. Uh, he thinks there's many successful models. 
Uh, one of them is uh, or just just at the, just the idea that the school district can be great if we just address this. Niall Sherwood Williams is a different candidate, a new candidate, and he says he would like to reopen schools immediately and never close them again. That was his answer. Kelly Lessons uh, has a lot of ideas. Uh, she's very focused on the relief funding to provide significant summer school acceleration options and or targeting tutoring groups between the months of May and August. She calls these acceleration academies and she sees like eight to 12 kids in a group over a one or two week period uh, or something like frequent short term high intensity tutoring. She'd also like to see the federal funding um, cap classroom sizes from K to three at under 15 students and grades four to eight at 25 students. So she'd like some of that federal funding to go there. Uh, she thinks the district will probably still have responsibilities around nutritional support for students. Uh, there may be more students homeless or in transition. Um, so that very, very complex answer from Kelly. Um, Alicia Hildy, who is on the board now running for reelection. Um, she basically wants to get our most, she was a fan of getting most at-risk students back into school this fall. Um, she's very interested in seeing the funding directed towards student learning. And um, that would include perhaps optional year-round model or robust summer school. She thinks the superintendent should, should recommend how they, the, the district go about that. But she said, as a board member, I'll be supportive of efforts to shift away from how do we make learning happen within the existing structures to how do we make learning happen even if we have new structured ideas. Mark Anthony Cox is also running for the school board. He, too, uh, he thinks we should try to come to a consensus on these issues, but he does think that we might get away from that agrarian school model uh, that uh, I think Tam mentioned. Uh, he's suggesting we might do um, a school schedule where you have 45 weekdays on and 15 weekdays off. Um, you might shorten summer, spring, and winter breaks just to get more instructional time. Sammy Graham is another candidate, and she likes data-driven decisions. Um, she said learning loss needs to be met with targeted instruction as soon as possible. She is, uh, she's worked in, in uh, library and preschool library programs, and she would like to get students comfortable with school again, and she thinks the school li library is a good way to do it. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. we got through all of that. Um, I think... I should read one. We have one comment, just so we want people to know we're interested mm -hmm. in, in uh, their participation before we go on okay. to the next one. Um, let's see. This is a question. Uh, this is for uh, seat G. And, of course, we don't have the candidates on, but, but she's making a statement about a candidate. In a recent forum, the HALO forum, candidate Vakalis responded to a question about one's favorite book by citing a novel by... Uh, Objectivist philosopher Anne Rand. Rand mm -hmm. referred to children with disabilities in her writings uh, and in public interviews as subnormal and opined that resources could be better employed supporting the gifted. Um, given Rand's theories about the supposed innate superior abilities of heroic individuals, that, that, I think that's mm -hmm. basically the comment. If if uh, if uh, Elisa Vakalis was here, uh, mm -hmm. this this uh, listener would want her to answer that question. Um, please comment on your philosophy of education and how it applies to special mm -hmm. needs students. It's good to get that idea out there. Um, that was there have been a lot of forums. If certainly this year there's been so many forums. So so some of these questions are coming from uh, seeing hearing candidates in other forums. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to take a, a caller. Um, Rosalind, welcome to uh, Running on Hometown Alaska. You have a question for us? Yes. How are you doing? How's the, how's the panel? Thank you for having me. <laughs> we're <laughs> so glad to have you. And I, I don't know, EJ and I are hanging on, but we're, there's so much information to get through. But go ahead and, and tell us what you, you want our audience to hear. One question that I think is important is right now we... Well, the school board, Ms. Margot Bellamy, is fighting for, like, the equity policy to be changed and the instructional policy. And I was wondering, how do you, who is, who, who do you think would benefit me the most 
through this. There's so many school board candidates. Mm -hmm. Who do you think would benefit me the most? As a black woman, I'm also an employee, and I have five children in the ASD school district. Who do you think would benefit me? Is that a fair question? You mean uh, which candidate would benefit you the best? Yeah, like there's just so many. I don't. No, I totally get it. (laughs) So many of my friends have said to me, "Okay, you're working on this. Who should I vote for?" It's like, well, you know, that's kind of what we're (laughs) we're trying to do here. We're trying not to actually endorse any candidate, but provide the information for you to weigh, you know, for yourself. I mean, we're not in the position to endorse or to tell you who to vote for. And neither is our panel. Our panel mm-hmm. hasn't even seen the answers from the candidates. Mm-hmm. We tried to have a clear blue, clear mm-hmm. line right through that so that they could offer us what their thoughts are about education and, and solving the, the, the spot we're in. Uh, but then we turn to the candidates and let them speak for themselves. So I, I can't actually give you an easy answer. I, I understand the question <laughs> completely, though. How about you, Eugene? Anything? Well, this might be a good time to remind uh, listeners that the candidates' answers will be posted on the alaskapublic.org website later. Yeah. So then they can look at yeah, each can, candidate's you can responses and then come up to an informed decision. Yeah, I think that's, mm-hmm. you know, you can't get a, around doing some of the work. I guess that that's probably the yeah, answer. Yeah, so, yeah. But I know you're busy, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, I hope that this program helps. I hope you can listen, and maybe based on what our panel says and then what the candidates say, mm-hmm. You know, maybe you can listen while you're doing something else, and then you'll you'll sort of get a sense of who you agree with and who you disagree with. How about that? Right, right. I mean, that's a good question. I hope they're listening. <laughs> the BIPOC community yes. is really listening to them. Like, mm-hmm. we, are, we are listening to these questions and these answers because we want to know who to vote for. Okay. Well, that's great. That, that mm-hmm. is really great. Um, I guess we should, as we've got one more, well, I'm going to, I'll hate, I'll, I'll wait on that caller. Mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and start topic two. And topic two. we are, you know, we're not going to get through all the topics, nope. but it's important to hear from you and we'll do our best mm-hmm. uh, to, 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 to help you while you're listening now and then send you to the web for the full answers later. So go ahead. EJ. All right. Okay. So back to the panel. Um, so topic two is about teachers. And so attracting and retaining quality teachers for our schools, right, it's been an ongoing issue. And so, you know, so what are your thoughts on how the ASD can better attract quality teachers and retain them? Uh, let's go to James first. Yeah, um, and I actually want to answer that one question <laughs> um, the young lady said, not, not to um, point out a specific candidate, but I think she's speaking to kind of a bigger issue with, um, with the school board candidates is that, these candidates are at large, and the problem is, is that you can't really identify them with them because you don't even know them. They're not from they're not mm. necessarily from your neighborhood. They're not mm-hmm. necessarily from your community. So, if she would have been able to at least know that someone in her district is running for um, running for school board, then she would be able to at least understand who uh, that person's point of view, or even probably even know the person that's running. But because the way that the school board is set up that is that large it causes this confusion that she's that she is presenting and i and i um and i'm sorry that she has to feel that way because we should know who our school board member is and we should and the school board member should know their community and their neighborhood um like the back of their hand so from my perspective this way of um uh, the way the school board is is structured should be changed to where it's just district only. Um, now to the question at hand, um, the question that I believe that you're, you're addressing is retaining uh, teachers. I, you know, just like any job, that when when a uh, an employee is not satisfied with their job, uh, at least their support, then they're more likely to leave. Um, if you're if you're talking about um, supporting our teachers, well, what does that what does that really mean? It's it's vital. It is absolutely vital that they have clear communication between the administration um, and and the teachers and uh, the school district at large because they're right there on the front lines and they're right there dealing with the with the children at that moment and if the feedback is not being received and and there's no communication between um, the teacher and the principal or, or principal in the school district then job satisfaction is definitely going to go um, absolutely down. So one-on-ones 
uh, daily interactions, understanding their uh, understanding what's actually happening in the classroom is vital to uh, one's job satisfaction. And of course, pay is, is important too, and understanding their retirement. But if there is conflict at the school and the principal is not willing to deal with it or deal with the issue that that's that's there, then yeah, that why why would the teacher want to stay there? Why would the teacher want to stay in that district when they when their voices are not even heard at all? But those who are willing okay. to hear the teacher and deal with the issue, then yes. All right. Thanks, James. That's my answer to that. I'm going to jump in because we do need to take another break. <laughs> Obviously, we're not going to. We're maybe going to get through three questions, but that's okay. Uh, I think the discussion is really good, and the yes. goal of this show is to draw people to the school board election mm-hmm. and help them understand some of the issues that are going on. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're going to take a tiny break. You're listening to Running on, uh, Running on Hometown Alaska. I'm your host, Kathleen McCoy. You're listening to Hometown Alaska on Alaska Public Media. You can find Hometown Alaska on alaskapublic.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Running on Hometown Alaska. I'm Kathleen McCoy here with co-host E.J. David. Our guests today are a panel of people with uh, expertise on education, Abby Hensley, James Smallwood, Tam Agosti Giesler, and our topic is the school board election, which is coming up April 6th. We were just uh, discussing uh, topic number two, which was how do you attract the best and brightest teachers and get them to stay here. So mm-hmm. uh, we just heard from James, mm-hmm. who actually jumped back and answered one of our colleagues' Another, questions. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, and also one of the other topics. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. So, <laughs> so uh, go ahead, EJ. Yeah, Abby, uh, let's go to you, Abby. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and thank you for the, the, the minute or two to think about this. Um, <laughs> so it, it seems to me that one of the things that, that may be missing sometimes in some of our American schools is the opportunity for teachers to really work together, um, to learn from each other, to, to teach each other, and, and not only the opportunity for, for more collegiality, but the time to do it. Um, and um, I, I mean, I think about what I, what I learned about the schools in Finland and the fact that, that teachers, for a whole, they, you know, there are a lot of other reasons why it's a, it's a good place to work, but um, but that teachers had an opportunity really to be together. And, and also I think another important thing would be to ensure that there was adequate professional development opportunities for teachers to support um, them in their communicating with parents, mm-hmm. um, and particularly of, uh, with parents of, of children who, you know, are, are, not, are, are, are dissimilar from the teacher. Um, I know that uh, we, you know we we brag a lot about the, mm-hmm. the diversity in our community, but I'm not sure that we do as much as we could to ensure that teachers um, have an opportunity to 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 learn how they can better communicate with with parents. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Abby. Um, Tam, thoughts on this question? Yeah, obviously, as a former educator, I have a lot of opinions <laughs> on that one. <laughs> I would say going back to James' response, he's right on in terms of the communication and the uh, teachers who feel supported by their administration, both in the building and in the district as a whole, are um, able to do their jobs so much better because they have that information. I know myself as a teacher, when I had an administrator who was clearly communicating to me about an issue, maybe something that I was really bothered with, but I knew that I was being listened to and I knew there was potential resolution coming down the line, um, I was a lot more flexible in terms of of dealing with things. I'm thinking about the year I had 35 students in every class uh, because a new school was being built, and they said this is temporary, and they kept me abreast on how that was happening so that I I knew that it was a temporary situation to have so many students on my class load. So those are, are things. I think the communication is key. Obviously, salaries and uh, a true retirement pension program are all um, pieces of retaining or attracting and retaining people in the state of Alaska as teachers. And those are very difficult questions in in our our state budget uh, challenges these days. But it is true. People need to know that there are many teachers that come to Alaska 
and work for five years, get the experience, and then transfer to other states that have full um, pension systems. Mm. So we do a lot of training of, of people and then, and then lose them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. somewhere there has to be a resolution in that to take care of that. I also think we need to, again, shift paradigms, uh, take an opportunity in this crisis to really rethink about how we've been doing things. And I know uh, a topic that's near and dear to Abby's heart, um, because we worked on 90% by 2020 through the United Way, is early childhood education and um, expansion of that. And if we had an opportunity for teachers to be able to get their um, own children um, into those early childhood education programs, where there was um, skill development needed. And even if there was uh, potentially some cost um, uh, borne by the teacher in addition to the the district, um, I think that those are all things that attract people to our district. Again, I'm using uh, a private industry where like Credit Union One has a child care center on site on their Abbott branch and the experience they've had with employees who won't, uh, don't even take a promotion to earn more money in different branches because they like having the child care facility close to you know, literally by, on their work where they can go see their kids at lunch. So some of these really innovative ways to think about um, how do you make the life uh, of an educator uh, more doable while they're giving their all to other people's children, I think will um, go a long way in attracting and retaining good mm. teachers. Um, If I could just tag on to that for just a second. Thank you, Tim. I hadn't thought about that before. I mean, you know, certainly I know about some of the employer-sponsored child care opportunities in our community, but not in terms of teachers. I I always wondered how teachers managed, teachers who are parents, managed to get to the parent-teacher conferences that were scheduled at the same time that they were holding parent-teacher conferences for the kids in in their own classrooms. So, yeah, we need to think about teachers as parents as well and haven't done a very good job of that I don't think. All right I'm going to jump back in this is Kathleen and we're going to take a look at what candidates had to say about uh, recruiting and retaining good teachers. Uh, I'm going to start with Sammy Graham she says that yes it's imperative to recruit and and recognize excellent teachers. Uh, She would like to see an accredited teacher certification program in Anchorage Mm -hmm. and salaries are need to be competitive. Dora Wilson, another candidate, says that um, Alaska teachers, you know, sort of homegrown Alaska teachers seem to do better. They understand the place better. So she's a a proponent of strong ties to the community. Uh, She'd like to see the teacher's retirement system improved. Uh, That would help uh, teachers stay longer. And in general, teachers need to feel supported, especially after such a long, difficult year. Uh, Rachel Blakesley, uh, uh, she says we need to find out why teachers are leaving. We need the data on that. Uh, she also says that teachers need to be responded to. They need to see their ideas percolate up and be used as solutions uh, if, in fact, they are good ideas. Um, and let's see, she thinks that representation is super important, uh, that, that, that the, 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 this teaching uh, faculty really need to look like the students they're teaching. She makes a point that over 50% of the district's 41,000 students are people of color, and 110 different languages are spoken among ASD families. So she sees that as a very unique opportunity to have a, a diverse uh, teaching force. Carl J- Jacobs, another candidate, says uh, he points out that there's no pension and no so- social security, uh, that that's got to be fixed. Um, Teachers can't access full Social Security or a pension. He um, says that sometimes teachers take a pay cut when their health plan gets more expensive and their salary isn't keeping up with it. And of course, he thinks that addressing retirement options uh, is absolutely critical. Edgar Blatchford, another candidate, says pay them and show them that you appreciate them for their good work. Uh, Elise Vakalis uh, says there's always contract negotiation changes. The opportunity for professional development might help teachers stay. And she's a proponent of smaller class sizes. Um, Pat Higgins points out the no defined benefit plan and that he says salaries, uh, in his view, have been flat for too long. Um, He says that uh, the district suffers when it hires teachers from the lower 48. Uh, that they do better with UA grads who stay because they're of the place. So he's a, a somewhat uh, a fond of uh, homegrown teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, and let's see, he, he definitely thinks that the, the school board and the superintendent need to listen to teachers. 
Dan Loring uh, cites two studies that he thinks have answers to retaining teachers and um, recruiting them. And he cites the district curriculum management audit and improving K through eight mathematics achievement report. Uh, Niall Sherwood Williams, another candidate, says link the pay directly to results in math, science, and technology by the students. Standardized test will, will standardized test results will determine the pay. Kelly Lessons has a different idea. She does think that if you succeed at retention, it will help with recruitment. Um, she also thinks teachers' ideas should be percolating to the top. Um, she thinks that teachers may need to be compensated uh, for uh, time provided beyond their defined duties. For example, when a new program is being implemented, the time it takes to learn all of that. Uh, professional development is high on her priority. Also a diversified workforce. Um, and she says that we can do the best job of bringing good teachers here if we have a healthy, healthy anchorage. So she's a, a proponent of keeping things healthy in Anchorage, uh, a vibrant city. Um, also supports mentorship, op mentorship opportunities and maintaining high expectations for teacher skills. Um, Alicia Hildy is an incumbent running for re-election. Um, she recognizes the strong competition for lower 48 teachers. Um, and that, let's see, uh, um, she supports a competitive teacher retirement system and competitive pay. Um, we have to focus on investing in teacher preparation within Alaska. And uh, at one point she has, she's got a legislative idea here. I support legislative efforts to allow certified teachers in other states to teach in Alaska for three years while they work on their certification. Mark Anthony, uh, another, uh, Mark Anthony Cox is, um, he, he believes that teachers who are dealing with the most diverse and challenging demographics should be incentivized incentivized when they achieve above average test scores, student performance, and attendance. He thinks teachers might need more leave days for self-care, and uh, he thinks that a, a teacher assistant program might be of use. Okay, that's what our candidates had to say. Yes. Great. Okay, so let's get back to the panel now. Um, so given the rich diversity of our school district and community, um, what are some of your thoughts on the best approach to equitably meet the needs of all students. Um, and you know, this can be you know, different socioeconomic status, uh, English language learners, students who need special education, different cultures and ethnicity. Let's start with Abby uh, for this question. Hmm. Well, I, it, it seems to me that one of the things, that, and, and some of these um, the, this topic has been addressed um, somewhat in some of the answers to the how to retain and recruit teachers. Um, but I think that if, um, um, for, first of all, just to know who, who the children are, who the students are in our community, would be one way to, to do that. Um, I know that, there, uh, that the, the way that we sort of figure out um, with how to group children um, sometimes has to do only with how we have to report to the federal government rather than what we think the best way to do that might be. Um, for example, when um, uh, a couple of years ago when we were, uh, when uh, Cook Inlet Tribal Council was looking at uh, and was working with the school district and the community and <clears throat> trying to figure out how many Alaska Native students there were in the district. Um, they, they went to an, an, another way of, of trying to find that out because some people just m marked mixed race or uh, anyway, it was a complicated thing. But, but the data that, that the school district had was not necessarily um, reflecting what were the, the, the children in the community. So I think, first of all, to figure out uh, on, in a better way who the children are in our community and what their, what their backgrounds are. Um, and then... Um, you know, uh, children who are in special ed have, you know, individual learning plans. Um, maybe that's what we need to do for every child um, to make sure that we are, are, are seeing that child for who mm -hmm. that kid really is. I know that um, kindergarten teachers, for example, um, 
meet with the the, the child and and family um, during the the first week of school. Um, they're not holding classes the first week of school typically, but meet with the family to find out more about that child. Um, and at that time, they do an assessment in, in a variety of of, um, of areas. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's just that that in person conversation. And I know that you can't do that with every child in every. Um, in every classroom, particularly as kids get into middle and high school, but um, figuring out some ways to to really find out who the children are and then what their needs mm-hmm. are. Um, okay, I, I'm going to just jump in here and say yeah. that we only have about five more <laughs> minutes left. Yeah. So um, if we could at least, uh, we maybe we'll only just get to finish up with this. And, with this and, one, yeah. Yeah, but go ahead, go ahead, Edie. Yo, go ahead. Um, let's go to Tam next. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, our our. Diversity is one of the richnesses of our, our community and our district. And we also have in the Anchorage School District uh, choice, which is one of the best features. When I talked about it with school board members from around the country at national conferences, they were utterly astounded at the amount of choice that people have to meet a different um, uh, pedagogy of philosophies, you know, Montessori to ABC, homeschool to blended to IB to, S, uh, you know, the school within mm-hmm. the school, career academies, all these different choices. The problem, however, in terms of the equity piece is transportation to all these. And the Anchorage School District does not and has never had enough money in order to allow transportation to all the different choice mm-hmm. options for students. And I do feel that um, plays a, a big role in terms of equity and how we solve that problem You know, I'm hoping uh, someone who uh, has a very innovative idea, I'm not talking, um, you know, uh, Lyft or one of these uh, types of transportation, but but how can we, for small groups, facilitate transportation to all these different um, choices that meet the needs better of our kids? Because Mm -hmm. when their needs are met, their, their, Mm -hmm. you know, cognitive abilities are going to soar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. I, w- I want to give uh, James a chance to chime in here real quick. Go ahead, James. Yeah, um, one point I do want to want to mention, and it was kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on, and I have to agree with um, uh, Dora Wilson and, and Pat Higgins uh, when it comes to uh, recruiting. And um, and I believe that the Anchor School District really should change their recruiting policy. Um, and what I mean by that. Um, requiring a certain amount of people from Anchorage or from Alaska um, in their in their recruiting when they're when they're looking at hiring individuals because I believe that if you bring up uh, people here from the state or from the city um, that's part of the community they should be able to be effective in in those classrooms uh, with the with the students and, and that area and then also I I would uh, agree with with Tam too I think we have one of the best. Um, districts out there when for the fact that we have all these different options all these different choice schools and um it's my understanding uh, one of the guardrails that was proposed uh, towards the superintendent that that um she has to address the um the underrepresented people that were the, that are part of the lottery so i'm hoping uh was based on the asd website that means that um they're going to provide some type of transportation for those kids who are able to go to a different, a different school, a uh, different larger school. James, um, I hope that James. does get addressed issue like that will. Thank you, James. Um, okay, this is Kathleen. I, I'm <laughs> jumping back in because the music is coming on, and frankly, uh, we got through a couple of topics, but not as many as we would have liked. Uh, but that's okay. We, we danced, uh, danced around a lot of the issues and, mm-hmm. and touched on them, and, and our yes. panel was really, really helpful. So thank you, Abby Hensley, Tam Augusta Giesler, and James Smallwood. And also thank you, EJ, for joining mm-hmm. me. Uh, next week, Running on Hometown Alaska will feature the mayor's race. We weigh the issues with a different panel of community members and share share candidates' responses. Find us on the web at alaskapublic.org. Um, Dave Emmert was our audio engineer. Thanks for joining us today on Running on Hometown Alaska.
Hometown Alaska is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Views expressed are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Hometown Alaska's theme song, Lead Dog, is by Kevin Barnett from Eagle River. Learn more about Hometown Alaska and listen online at alaskapublic.org. This is Alaska Public Media.